Yulia Corner, also known as Dairu, has been creating visual stories ever since she was seven. Even though she opted for a design route, she has been slowly transitioning to being a full-time artist. Her work combines digital with traditional art, such as watercolor, to give life to the most unique characters. You can find more of her work at dairu.de, but for now, please join us as we discuss how to achieve the correct water pigment ratio with watercolor, how different brushes can wield different results when painting, the difference between hot and cold pressed watercolor paper and why cotton matters so much, combining traditional with digital painting, and why Yulia hated watercolor when she first started. Want to be part of the show? Then send in your questions or topics you'd like to see covered to our email at hello at etcherlab.com. If you send us an audio recording, we might include it in the episode. Hi, I'm Manya, and this is Make More Art, a podcast by Etcher, meant to inspire you to keep on creating. Now let's hear from our guest. Julia, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm super excited to have you here. For starters, I was checking your website, and I there's a there are plenty of things I I can't wait to dig to dig in. But before okay. we start, can you tell me <laughs> when your love for art began? Do you remember that? Um, I guess it's kind of this classical things like I was always drawing things. Yeah. Um, but of course, I think a huge imp- inspiration also was like all these um, animated series and the first animes in, like in the 90s when they came to Europe. Oh, the and, 90s. Oh, the golden yeah. <laughs> and, and I remember I just loved uh, to watch them all with my sister. And then we started to try to draw the, these characters or invent new characters and kind of invented our stories, like pretty serious and so. So I think like this as an inspiration point and then with my sister like trying to record things or even stories fitting to this was like a bit uh, is it an really older or younger sister that's the oldest sister and the younger one. Ah, oh that is so <laughs> sweet so you st- you were you drawing together mm-hmm, yeah to create the stories that you came up with so yeah. you were basically breathing life into the stories that came to you through art and crayons yeah. and pencils and whatever yeah, exactly. Like, and sometimes we were drawing these characters and then cutting them out. Like, instead oh. of having some figures or so, like oh we were just God. drawing them and then cutting them out. So we had like two. two that is so precious. Oh my goodness. Oh. Oh, I love it. Oh, how old were you? Uh, I don't know, seven, eight, something like this. Seven, eight, nine. Beautiful. And and when did you make the shift that art was something you wanted to do for a living? Um, actually, I think just like just uh, like three years ago, mm-hmm. kind of like um, because actually I was studying design because of this typical thing like oh god, studying illustration, you will be a poor artist. You yeah, will start with, yeah, the starving and, artist thing. Oh, yeah, the starving artist thing exactly. So I think actually a lot of artists that studied something design related because it's yeah. kind of this creative direction. Yeah, and, but, but it looks also, like there might be more jobs because it looks more corporate. Oh my god, we are so busy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I think it's a typical thing. I mean, of course, it's also you do kind of you know, like the brighter board of services that you can give. So yeah, maybe it's... yeah, they are all my jobs, but I think also they are more designers than illustrators. So mm-hmm. I think actually it's more or less the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. um, yeah, so I studied design, and after my design studies, I um, was basically um, a freelancer for one year. And then I realized actually the most requests I'm getting is more for illustrating or because like, okay, we did like the design work, but also we really love the illustration work. So mostly I got like more like people yeah, commissioned me or asked me to work for them more because they really like my illustration work. Mm-hmm. Then they said like your design work was so outstanding. So I was like, okay, so maybe that's actually really, I mean, I knew it's what I enjoy more. Mm-hmm. But I also thought, okay, maybe that's also what I really can, I'm standing out more with this work because I guess I enjoy it more, so maybe I do more effort or passion into it and that's visible. So yeah, that's where I came to like, okay, let's 
trying to go more into um, so you slowly stuff. so it's like the design helped you get your foot inside the art space and you slowly transitioned to full-time art and left the design behind right yeah actually i'm still kind of in transition mm -hmm. phase because actually i'm still having a um, part-time job as a um, designer like uh, this typical like okay i have something to pay my rent yeah. and um, additionally i'm half time working as an illustrator like doing my own projects selling prints and also doing commission work yeah. but of course it's hard a bit to balance all so i'm also kind of checking like how long i can handle this mix because it's getting a bit more and more and more and i think at some point i have to decide okay too much work can I do all so i will drop the design completely and go to the to the art artist yeah because it's what gives you the most enjoyment right i'm assuming yeah exactly yeah, really, our lives are so short, might as well just do what we love the most. So I was looking at your website and you say that your creative love belongs to illustration, color and light design and character design and connect mm -hmm. these fields with each other. So that's what your website says. So why do you think color and light are so important? Um, for me, is I mean, for me, the main goal that I want to transport when I do illustration or mm -hmm. also I think in general, mostly for art, is like you want to transport a feeling, a mood, or a mm -hmm. kind of message. Mm -hmm. And for me, color and light are really important for this. Uh -huh. Like, um, yeah, to kind of transport the feeling and the mood I want to give the person who will look at the illustration or the art later. And for me, it's the best way to express it with these tools. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, characters are also quite good always because it fun for yourself to create them and also it's always really easy for people to rely or um, not rely, um, relate to something yeah. if there's a character. I mean, of, it depends, of course, if you just want the mood of a landscape and the landscape also can tell a lot, but if you, of yeah. course, have a character doing something in the landscape, then you already have, again, a bit more storytelling, like what a character is doing there. And, yeah, Where they're exactly. going to and all this, so you have already a lot of little story there. Exactly, because it's not just putting a character in one position, it's to give them a whole depth of who they are and where they come from to make everything more believable and to create empathy so you can truly connect with the characters and the space and feel like they have been lived in, the spaces yeah. and such. And so also more curiosity, like you are thinking like okay, where this person is coming from or like yeah. why they have a backpack or why they have this and then you have a bit more like engagement with the people like because it's like a lot of things that they can see and ask for like imagine what is happening there mm -hmm. so it's not just putting pencil on paper and just magically creating a cool looking character like <laughs> uh no <laughs> there's this is an actual job guys okay so now looking at your art you have a lot of traditional art and you have a lot of digital art and you also say that they kind of complement each other right mm -hmm. so what do you mean by that um i don't know i think a lot of people are like they're just on digital side like um not a lot of people but some people are really like ah, just digital things are cool because they're more edible you can do more things or mm -hmm. some people are like oh, just traditional art is real art because it's you need more skills or whatever or there is no undo button and I don't know for me it's like like I thought I like both and I think both have good things and uh -huh. you can learn from both like if you work traditionally you can have learning effects that you can bring to the digital art and also the other way around sometimes you maybe experiment with light and then you're like ah oh, that's how light works in this situation and when you understand it you also can do it in traditional art better and uh -huh. Also, sometimes it's like you can, I don't know, you start maybe a illustration traditionally and you can still add to finish, the, it, finish yeah. it. So, I don't know, it's for me, it's not like you can just be one thing or the other or like one thing just has to be done traditionally 100% or whatever. It's, mm -hmm. For me, it's not like a fight of the two elements. It's, the it's more like you can work with both good, you can, they can help each other you learn from yeah. the different media yeah because i'm thinking about it and it's like if you can do many quick moves digitally 
you also have the undo button. You can quickly like do ten thumbnails of color to yeah, study a scene, and it's like super fast. And you just like slash slash slash. Oh, actually, the green doesn't look so good. Let me just quickly change it to red. Yep, it brings it pops up. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, good. I guess I found the color combination, and that takes you a fraction of time than to do it traditionally with let's say like watercolor or something that needs space to dry so you can actually see how much red and the amount of how, how like what is the exactly hue of the red while digitally that is so much faster and then maybe you can just go to paper and watercolor and whatever medium you like to use traditionally and then you just the color you know what colors to use so you can just go traditionally so that's yeah. kind of an idea of how you could combine things right yeah exactly for example for um, the inktober pieces i did last month Sometimes mm -hmm. I was like, um, before I, I don't know, um, before I draw everything, and then meanwhile um, doing the values because I mean, in October you don't have so much colors, so yeah. one problem is to worry about which color match. But um, so you have to focus more about the values, and often I, um, for example, made just a really rough, ugly filling digitally before mm -hmm. to see like okay this has to be darker and this has to be brighter because they're next to each other so it works better so that's what you also taught like sometimes you can just test this thing in one medium and then transfer it to the traditional or vice versa so. yeah that makes a lot of sense talking about inktober so for those of you who don't know inktober is a almost world-class event every october artists like to participate by making art every single day and usually there's a prompt every day jake parker is the founder of inktober and throughout the whole month every day you have a a prompt and you make traditional art it, it supposedly came from using ink but the whole point is for you to make art every day so it really doesn't matter what you use um and i was you've been participating in inktober for a while if i'm not mistaken right mm -hmm. And you made a small booklet out of, was it last year, Inktober's, the memory booklet that you made? No, I think it was two years ago. Three years ago, yeah. Okay, so do you usually do that, take advantage of Inktober to create a small project? Um, actually, I think like we did a whole Inktober of making these 31 drawings and we can could just pull through once. It was after I finished my master and I was unemployed and I nothing else to do. Oh, okay, month. so you had that time really, that one time, yeah. Yeah, because really, I, I don't know how people are doing it to have a job. I know, like I did I did do. three drawings this, this year, three. Yeah, and for me, Inktober is crazy. Like, really, if I see some artists that I, I know, like, oh, my, you maybe even have a studio full time job, I'm like, how oh, are you doing this? So, for example, um, I don't know, the years after I took it more relaxed, I was like, okay, the days I feel like and the most mm -hmm. I can do, I do it. And um, for me, it's mostly really like this point of practicing. And it's yeah. really nice if I see my older Inktober pieces and then compare them from the new year. And oh, I'm that's like, a great tip. Ah, oh, cool. And then you really see like, oh, okay, it was one year ago, and now I'm there, and that's how I draw now, and then you have really a cool comparison. So for me, I think it's really more this thing, or like um, things that I wanted to try. I think last year, for example, it was, um, I saw that Louis, I think the year before, she was drawing a lot with this orange pencil, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. she always worked with like this ink and the um, orange pencil that you still can mm -hmm. see and I really like this combination so last year I tried more like um, the red pencil and the ink to work both of them together mm -hmm. and this year for example I was like okay I always saw these cool things of ink and gold, tea to keep gold details so I was like okay this year I want to make some gold tea. so tips and gold details here and there and so it was yeah it was really nice yeah. to always try something new and yeah, what it's you can do. a great way to challenge yourself, keep everything fresh. That's a good idea. That's a great tip. Um, this year's Inktober, you did a lot of wizarding stuff. You had a lot of cats, a lot of uh, witches and wizards. W why do you love that theme so much? Why did you pick that theme? Mm, I think it's also maybe because of in October, everyone is a bit of Halloween mode. <laughs> so you're kind of with this Halloween thing, like a bit magical. And yeah, I think it's this combination yeah. of like autumn calls for it yeah it mm -hmm. calls for it um yeah and looking at your art in um as, so yeah you do digital you do traditional and 
your traditional art is just adorable, as, as is your digital. They are very much uh, the same. But you're doing a live demo with us on December 8th, and it's going to be fully traditional. And we have mm -hmm. discussed the theme and everything. So would you like to tell us a little bit more about what you will be doing there? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, the thing will be like winter Christmas mm -hmm. theme a bit, mm -hmm. because um, when we talked the last time, I was like, okay, which topic could be cool? And I know, like, beginning of December, everyone starts already to think about Christmas. Yeah, like October, so, Halloween, December, Christmas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but like, I don't know, like, for certain months, you just have topics that you hardly can get around <laughs> and just really try to avoid them. So, um, yeah, um, we were also, I think, um, we found this little postcard that I did some years ago, and yeah. it's, such, eh, it's a cool idea. So yeah, it will be like little postcards that you can create. I mean, no one has to buy postcards. It's quite easy. Also, you just can take a normal paper and cut it to the size mm -hmm. of a postcard. And it will be uh, winter themed. So um, I think mostly I will check for some kind of winter animals that into the seasons mm -hmm. like and in terms so of technique and materials if i recall correctly we're doing watercolor and we're using like two colors right do i remember that correctly yeah mostly it's two colors like uh, maybe uh, mostly i guess a warm color for like having the, the cozy christmas feeling mm -hmm. and a bit, bit darker bluish color yeah to yeah. to to con counterbalance it mm -hmm. um so yeah can you tell us a little bit more about your watercolor painting and because if you're so much about color and light how can we achieve the emotion that you talked about with just two colors um i think it's for example quite easy like you have to think first okay do i want a really bright um setting or do i want it really dark so with watercolor okay. it means that you um, water down your color a lot Mm -hmm. So uh, we have it quite um, in the pastel colors, like really bright and soft. Mm -hmm. Or if you say, okay, you want it to maybe a bit more darker, then you will uh, have to apply a lot more um, intense the color, like mm -hmm. less water down. Okay. Um, and um, so of course, first before you start, either way you have to think a bit like what I want to draw, how I want it to, to be the mood, and. Um, yeah, basically, I think that's it. Like, first have a bit of vision of where it has to go. Mm -hmm. And um, then it's like thinking, okay, if I want it more cozy, then you will use more warm colors. And if you want it to be more, I don't know, mystical, magical, then maybe a bit more bluish, violet, darker colors. And then it's all about the pigment water ratio. Yeah and getting those shades, those contrasts, and where to leave the whites, and get that triple pop, I guess. Yeah. And that's what we're yeah. going to show us on the live demo on December 8th, I guess. Exactly. Also to work a bit with like negative spaces and so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I know exactly which motif I will draw, <laughs> because it's still more than one month. But um, yeah, we mostly like to try to um, show this wet and wet technique, so you mm -hmm. have this little um, gradients that, and this little um, water bleedings that randomly yeah. appear. Yeah, so making the most out of the spontaneity of watercolor. Yeah, so um, I think it's a bit hard sometimes for people to appreciate it because with this um, wet and wet and this uh, water bleeding, it's of course a lot less controllable, so you have to always live a bit with the happy accident. Oh yeah, yeah, you have to embrace the yeah, lack of control like, that watercolor okay, does. Now, now it's like this, but okay. So Yeah, we are uh, going to learn how to go with the flow because that's the way you do with watercolor. Just yeah. breeze through and embrace it and like, yeah, it's bleeding or it's not and ah, who cares. Yeah. Just going to make it look magical all the same. And in the end, basically, just adding a bit of details um, with colored pencils or with like a bit white for snow or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be quite cute and magical and I can't wait for the live demo because uh, I think I'm going to learn quite a lot. From all the traditional materials you have tried, which one mm -hmm. do you love the most? Um, I think watercolor and colored pens. Okay, sure. why? And the combination of it is really nice. That's uh -huh. why, because it's two mediums that you can use like 
a part of each other. You can just work with watercolor and you can just work with color pens, uh -huh. but you also can combine it. Okay. So that's something I really enjoy a lot. And um, for me, watercolor was at the beginning a love-hate relationship. So I think right now I'm just really happy that I kind of managed it. Power really through. Okay, tell me that through. story. Why did you hate it so much? What happened? Um, because I think at the beginning I was just working always with too much water. So for okay. me, it always was like a huge mess. I never could really control it. And I always, at the beginning, I was not satisfied. And I also was like, oh, why the colors look so shitty? Yeah, of course, if you water them down, then of course they're not bright anymore. Okay. <laughs> things like this. Or if you mix five colors and in the end you wonder muddy. why it's all grayish and muddy. Exactly. Yeah, everything so. gets gray and brown. Like, how do I, I, I remember, oh my God, when I was in high school, I had a friend who never knew how to make brown. And oh. we told her like, okay, there are different ways to make brown. For me, the one I like the most is if you get uh, red with uh, green and it gets like a really, you know, reddish brown. It's it's pretty. So try it. And then the next day she was like, oh, I forgot. Can you tell me again how you mix uh, how you mix to get brown? And my friend was like, don't tell her. She needs to figure this out by herself. Tip: if you mix everything, you'll get brown. But good luck loving it. And then we just she just turned her back on her, and she oh, was no. left alone to figure out how to make brown. And she mixed every single thing she had on her palette. And like, well, this works. Well, this is kind of an ugly brown. Like, how how do I make a nice brown again? <laughs> like, uh, fail and learn. Fail and learn. So you won't yeah. ever forget again. Exactly. So that was for me at the beginning watercolor, fail and learn, fail and learn. But now I think now that I found like my way of working with it, I really enjoy it because um, I know now I understand it. I know like if I do this, then it will have this effect, and if okay. I work with, with this and then make a low layer over it, I have more clear shade and all things like this. It's also what I will show in the workshop. Mm -hmm. I will show like okay, you can have like nice bleeding things, but of course they're less controllable and. Uh -huh. If you, for example, here and there want more details, then we will wait until it's dry. That always was my most take. I didn't oh. wait until it's dry, and then everything mixed together. I was like, oh, this shadow line is not clear. Yeah. So it's also a bit about patience and working in the right time. <laughs> you cannot apply everything when it's wet because then everything will mix, either way, if you don't want it. How did you How did you learn how to be patient with watercolor? Any tips? <sighs> Uh, no. I know. I think it's really just if you are like, okay, this is not doing what I want <laughs> because everything is still wet and uncontrollable, then you kind of just have to be learning and how to yourself to like, okay, wait, just go up, make a tea, come back. And yeah, yeah, get out of the continue. hole. Yeah. Yeah. What I do personally is I work on two pieces at the same time. So while I wait for one to I'm a very impatient person. Very impatient. And if I don't feel like having tea and getting out and I like, I have been through this. I'm starving and I need to eat, but I refuse to get off my chair because this needs to work. So what I found for myself is that if I have two pieces and I work in one and I should be waiting for that one to dry because sometimes you can work on the top of the image or while the top dries, you can go to the bottom or whatever. Sometimes that's not possible because it's a big wash or whatever. So I just put it aside grab the other image and start working on it and when I get to a point that I have to wait again the other one it's usually dry by now and if it's not that's when I mess up um, so working on it so you have the discipline of getting up making a tea or a coffee or grabbing a piece of cake or something yeah. breathe in breathe out and come back yeah or maybe just meanwhile it's drying, look at it and think like, oh, maybe I want to put some details there or mm, there, or check, check some references in between, clean your brushes from the color, whatever, yeah. <laughs> something around there. But um, with the um, postcards, I actually also did it because they are quite small. So mm -hmm. actually, I also was working on both postcards that I prepared um, for the preview of the workshop at the same time because for what you told, like, okay, I applied, of course, a lot of water for these nice bleeding edges uh -huh. and for this soft effect. So I will know if I apply a lot of water, it will have to dry quite yeah. some time. So, yeah, I don't know if it's possible for the live demo to work on two pieces. I think it would be a bit too much. But I guess in the workshop, for example, I will do it like this that you have kind of two things and you can put one away. Meanwhile, it's drying, you can work on the other one. Yeah. You can also use a heat gun or a blow dryer. 
Yeah, I don't have one of them, so... <laughs> I don't like using them, because personally, it's a personal preference. Uh, maybe it's just because I'm not used to it. That's another thing. Sometimes you don't like things because we are not used to using them. Yeah, but with the blow dryer, also would be afraid, like, you kind of... Okay, sometimes when it happens, I really soak up my things with water, so it's mm. really like a little lake, and if I would imagine to use the blow dryer, I kind of put the water, yeah, in the other edge where I don't want it. Like, maybe I want it pigment in the middle where it's drying and I would press it to the outside water of the water mm -hmm. edge. I would just leave it where it is. In, in the other uh, hurdle that you found that, you know, too much water, too little pigment, how did you learn that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think basically if you just like, mostly if you wait until it's dry because then you see how the dry mm -hmm. color will really look like because when it's wet it always looks a bit more brilliant. Mm -hmm. color. And I think mostly it's like, if you always, like, several times had the effect, like, why it looks so dull or so not, yeah, bright enough with pigment, then it just, like, next time, just like, okay, just put the pencil, uh, the, the brush with more pigment, mm -hmm. and I like, more. It sometimes can also happen it's too much, but that's the good thing with watercolor, that just put some water in. Yeah. Wash it down again. So I think that's less the problem. And I mean, also if you see like, okay, I think it's too little pigment, especially me where it's still wet, also still can add something. So. Exactly. That's what I do. Yeah. I just put like what I think is a moderate amount of pigment, then I find it perfect. So if I find it perfect, I, I have to remember this is going to dry. So this is not perfect. So I just yeah. add a little bit more. So it's just a little bit more than what I wanted. And usually that's kind of what I like. And when it yeah. dries down, it's it's good. But yeah, it's like you said, you have to try multiple times because different colors have different pigments and the pigment might react differently to the water. Or sometimes it's the brush. Some brush kind of grab more pigment than other brushes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, um I was, when I, for example, changed from the uh, old um, brushes I had and I tried the um, synthetic brushes that mm -hmm. you guys sent me because uh -huh. I was really excited, like, I oh, find these synthetic water brushes because <sighs> I'm like, okay, the other ones are nice, but the poor animal hair, so I always was excited to spray, uh, try synthetic yeah. brushes and the first time I was like, oh, okay, okay, the pigment works different with this brush. Yeah, exactly. And it also was, again, a, a learning effect, so... But I think it's in general, if you even change just the brand of brushes or so, you always need a kind of little test paper to see how the pigment works with your brush, how much or also how they are applying and giving it back to the paper. Uh -huh. So but I mean, that's why I always have, for example, what I also will show in the workshop, I always have my um, piece that I'm working on it and I have this little paper that's mostly just some cutting rests of paper, but of the same kind of paper that you work on to see how it reacts on the same paper um, mm -hmm. for testing. Also like um, sometimes when I want to see how two colors look dry on each other or next mm -hmm. to each other, I will apply to the test paper mm -hmm. before on the final drawing. Great tip. Really great tip. And that's another thing, you know, paper. If you're used to using, okay, you know how the pigment works because you're used to that paint. Awesome. You know how the brush works because you've been using that brush for a while. So, you know, it took you a few times, but finally you understood how brush and pigment work with each other. And then you change the paper. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, of course, that's always the other factor. I mean, um, I, for example, learned that I like a lot the cold press watercolor mm -hmm. paper because um, for me, it's often that I, I don't know, we work one part three, five times. Okay. <laughs> so for me, this paper works quite nice because you can rework it a lot of times without having this effect when the yeah the, uh, the paper peels off and cannot take any more pigment until you reach this point. This on the cold press paper a lot. You have a lot more time to rework until you have this thing happening. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's because the paper is cold press or because you have different types of cold press and hot press paper? Because um, in, in, my, in my opinion or experience, what I see is the more cotton a paper has, and it's not just about the cotton, it's all, there are so many factors, it's so hard. But if, you, if you're using a paper that has a, a, a lot of cotton, it's usually more resistant than one that has yeah. little to no 
close to no cotton, right? So yeah, I'm assuming if you have a wood pulp, 100% wood pulp, mm. cold pressed paper, and then you have a 100% cotton hot pressed paper, maybe yeah. the hot pressed paper is going to hold down the washes much better than the cold press in this instance. Yeah, that's true. I mean, mostly I think all the watercolor paper is with cotton that I have, mm -hmm. so I don't have the comparison with this. Uh, okay, good. Maybe. So yeah. So, because of the okay, tooth, if you have maybe? a hot press, yeah, if they have the uh, hot press cotton and the cold press cotton, that's of course better comparable. Yeah, because maybe, in, and just for those of you who don't know, so cold press paper has this little tooth to the paper, it's textured and mm -hmm. the water kind of not flows around so much as with the hot press that is completely smooth surface and the water dances a little bit more because nothing is kind of holding it together. So I'm assuming that might be the case. Maybe with the hot press, the water dances around so much that yeah. maybe it wears out the paper easier than the cold press or something. I don't know. There are many, many things to consider. Yeah. I just, for me, learned that I like more the cold press because also, like you told, it's more toothy, so I yeah. appreciate the structure more because for me, it's really like if I want to work in watercolors, I kind of want this uh, more structured surface also. Mm -hmm. Especially if you work with the color pencils on top, it's a really nice effect that you can have um, when you work with the more structured paper. So I think also that's where it's coming from. I like to work more with the cold press one because of the yeah. combination of the color pencils. And it's the kind of work you do, you like it better, which makes a lot of sense. I, I prefer hot press, usually, mm -hmm. because I love how the water um, kind of just washes away. And the pigment kind of, depending on the pigment, the pigment I use, um, I use the, the Etcher watercolor set mostly. Uh, totally not promoting them. <laughs> I'm linking the blog post associated with this episode <laughs> at etcherlaw.com forward slash Yulia. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, we, when using the hot press, the pigment kind of washes away with the water and creates like this fading effect that I love mm. a lot when I'm doing plein air. I just love it so much. So... My preference, usually, uh, again, depending on the subject and what the intended effect is, is, is hot press. And yeah, I like that yours is cold press, so we can have a debate about one versus the other. This is, makes everything so much more interesting. <laughs> okay, good. Um, any more uh, tips that you have for people who are trying watercolor? something that comes to mind, something that you struggle with when doing watercolor, something you discovered? I think everyone kind of has to discover their own mm, order of what they color. Mm -hmm. For example, some uh, have a really strict order, like they really start with what makes most sense actually, really start with the background. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you, for example, paint a plain air environment, you will mm -hmm. start with the sky. That's the thing that is the most in the back. So <laughs> I do the opposite. <laughs> I also would do the opposite, but I saw a lot of people they really start like kind of by the order like what is more in the background or in, especially what is brighter you start with. Uh -huh. Um actually I also mostly do that I start with the more brighter colours yeah. and then then do the more darker ones. But sometimes it also happens especially with the enclosure things, so I don't know why. It is sometimes started with the dark ones and then yeah. put the light ones. So, but like I told, I think there's not like in general order like all oh, watercolor artists have to work like this. I think it's yeah. more like everyone has to find the order that works for them. Like for mm -hmm. some people, it works if they maybe start with the details in the for in the foreground and then even just add background details. And for some people, it's different. They first kind of want to work out the background details and then add the details or the the object, whatever it is, in the foreground. Yeah. So I think everyone just has to kind of find their order of how to color which part. Great. Awesome. And that's a wonderful way to wrap up our episode. Now I wonder, what is your number one watercolor struggle? Please let us know in the comment section of the post associated with this episode at etcherlab.com forward slash Yulia. That's e t c h r l a b dot com forward slash j u l i a. Like the podcast? Help us support the show by subscribing and giving us a five star rating and review on Apple Podcasts at etcherlab dot com forward slash go forward slash apple. See you in the next episode, and until then, let's make more art. <laughs>